Let's go over to the virtual world of sports now, talking about eSports, which is the short for electronic sport. It is a competitive playing of video games for cash and prizes. Now, they are organized global and multi-jurisdictional leagues involving professional teams who compete for millions of pounds of pr in prize money, as well as a variety of online amateur leagues too. eSports audiences are projected to top 335 million in 2017, allied with commercial revenue growth estimated to hit $465 million in the same year. Now, eSports is entering the mainstream and it's beginning to gain major weight in the Nigeria market. Remember, you can join us in the conversation on 906 555719 Put us through what um, this thing, eSports, is all about because now that there's a global pandemic, um, football, basketball, and lately, tennis players are beginning to go virtual, playing competitions. Well, and most of these monies gotten from these competitions are used to give back back to charity and also to fight this uh, pandemic. Well, uh, you said it all. It's a virtual, um, virtual sport. Mm -hmm. Just like the way you have your teams, you have your players, they do their transfers. That mm. is the same way you have um, the esports industry. Mm. It's becoming a multi-billion uh, dollar industry. I heard when you said three hundred and um, fifty like million that. dollars. That was as two thousand and seventeen. Mm -hmm. Currently, uh, is worth over one billion US dollars. Wow! And um, interestingly, we have an association, the Esports uh, Federation, Federation in Nigeria. In Nigeria. So they are they are they are very busy. They uh, did a number of webinars during the break as well. Mm. So, but um, there are also issues. There are some legal issues surrounding esports. Mm. Uh, part of which is um, the issue of uh, regulation. You don't have a central. Uh, you don't have a central uh, federation with an overarching uniform rules like you have FIFA mm. dictating the pace in the regular sports industry. So that has been one of the issues. Then you have IP issues uh, with regards to developers of esports mm. uh, who are the original IP owners of most of these um, uh, properties. Yeah. So uh, there have been issues with regards to this ownership and um, the issue of live streaming the uh, breach of the end user license by uh, live streamers. Interestingly, there was a decision from Brazil last year um, declaring um, live streaming of uh, esports illegal. So uh, there are a number of issues that I'm sure my mm. colleague would also do for that justice. Today. All right, talking about his colleague, we have Felix Mwosu from Petchton and Grace joining us this morning via Skype. Good to have you with us, Felix. Good morning, Mr. Tuka. Yeah, good morning. It's good to have you with us. Now, let's go straight to what we have this morning. It's all about esports. Can you put us through the commercial and uh, the legal framework of this uh, sort of business? Okay, thank you. Um, a quick background before I, I delve into the legal and commercial framework of esports. Um, a, a lot of people may be watching and they do not know what esports is all about. It's competitive video gaming um, at any level, really. It could be at the casual or professional level, but for the purpose of um, this discourse, we'll focus on esports at a professional level. Now, how does it really work? Um, esports teams sort of field professional players in their squads, and then they are pit against each other to play for cash prizes. Um, elite teams have um, uh, full contracts with these players, and then they, they go either one against one, two against two, as the case may be, and then they play um, in, in sort of leagues or tournaments. Now, the, the good thing about esports is um, it does not, it's open to anyone, it's genderless, a male or a female could participate. Um, it does not really entail uh, any sort of physical exertion, so it's also not dependent on the physical ability of a person. Um, you could play it on your mobile phones, they play esports on mobile phones, you could play it on your personal consoles, you could also play it on your PlayStation consoles or Xbox consoles, as, as the case may be. Um, so it's, 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 um, it's a very interesting area. So delving into into the commercial um, framework of esports, I would say that the esports industry. Um, I I could hear um, you and Mr. Steve already throwing some light on it. They, they've they've attained the meteoric rise uh, in the past uh, decade. You have you have the projection in 2019 uh, put at 1.1 billion dollars. Um, the, the revenue could be gotten from a whole lot of areas. Uh, they get it from sponsorship, merchandising, ticketing, brand advertisement, and the likes. Um, I'll just I'll just quickly drop a couple of figures 
from last year that got people um, wondering about uh, this particular area of sports. Um, in terms of viewership in 2019, there's this very popular esports championship called League of Legends Championship that took place in uh, Paris. Uh, it's it fueled over 100 million independent viewers at the event, which was a record breaking from what they fueled in 2018 at uh, over 99 million viewers. Um, we also have cash prizes now getting really, really, really hefty. Um, I remember a very, the very most expensive one was also in 2019, the Dota 2 uh, final, which filled about $25 million. So commercially, it's getting really commercially viable at the moment. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, as, as it concerns the legal framework yeah. of esports, I would want to use this opportunity to um, sort of gauge the esports industry in Nigeria. I believe there are certain futures that uh, a national association must have uh, to be able to be seen, to have attained a certain level of legitimacy. And, and what are those features? Um, one, we have the presence of a central body uh, that, is, that is primary. Two, a robust legal and regulatory framework, uh, which will cover areas of um, rules of competition generally, um, intellectual property considerations, data protection, um, anti-doping, and some other areas of sports integrity. So I'll just, I'll just sort of um, get into this in more detail. It goes, as it concerns the central body, it goes without saying that uh, an, an, an association would be better served to have a national body that would legitimize its affairs in a jurisdiction. As you rightly mentioned, in Nigeria, we have the uh, governing body of eSports, which is eSports Nigeria, uh, which was established a couple of years back. Uh, it has the mandate of um, legitimizing eSports, accrediting its members. I know presently it has uh, about 70 registered entities uh, under its member association. Um, it also um, ac um, licenses, gives out licenses as and when do, and manages uh, events and tournaments under its purview. I also know that the eSports Association in Nigeria has an arm known as the Nigerian eSports League, and they're presently managing the tournaments now known as the FIFA 20 uh, Pro Clubs League. Even internationally, um, there are some bodies that have been set up to sort of carry out the parent body role over this association. So it's just like what we have in traditional sports. Take uh, football, for example, where you have uh, FIFA at the top um, at, um, administering affairs down to the national member associations. Um, um, however, there are a couple of international associations when it comes to esports. I, I know that the Esports Nigeria is a member of um, the International Esports Omnipol Committee in Korea, that IOC. They are also a member of um, the Esports Federation of Africa at the continental level, and they are also a member of Westco West um, West uh, Esports Commission Westco in uh, Brazil. So there are a whole couple of them. There is even the one International Esports Federation, which was the first of of the many international stations to come up. Now, while that is advantageous to the extent of well, um, trying to streamline their activities and also sort of guide them in terms of support all those specs that are accorded to uh, international member affiliation. I have, I have a problem with the fact of, of the multiplicity of these international associations. I feel it would be better if uh, they take a cue from what is going on in traditional sports, uh, like, uh, like I said, FIFA, uh, where you have just one body uh, to sort of streamline its activities so that where the, that international body um, puts in place certain statutes and regulations, it will be followed down the line. It, it's, it says to help the unification objective. Okay, um, for my second point, which is uh, a robust uh, legal and regulatory framework, mm -hmm. um, I, I think the, the regulatory framework of esports in Nigeria at the moment is uncertain, but it's not peculiar to them. I feel a lot of countries are having issues with trying to understand uh, the reach of esports as a traditional sport in, in, in that sense to be able to better regulate it. So, what normally happens is um, these event organizers, because there are certain event organizers that handle these events, so they create event-specific rules uh, to last for the for the lifetime of that event uh, to bother basically primarily on the registration of players, uh, certain areas of sports integrity. It's 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 important that I know that a national association should have excuse me a national association should have. Uh, domesticated rules and regulations within its framework to cover, like I said earlier, uh, protection of intellectual property. There might be 
uh, situation. Uh, for example, let's take the, the most common one. These games that are being played are owned by uh, game publishers or game creators. Uh, in the event that you're hosting a commercial, a commercially, uh, commercially motivated tournament or league, you're supposed to seek and obtain consent from the owners of these games before you can use those games in your events. So in, in, the, in that event, there should be um, a framework put in place in regards to how that will go if you're going to do it expressly or, or impliedly. There are also issues of image rights. Um, participants that play professionally uh, have intellectual property rights in terms of using their image for uh, brand marketing and the like. So you should also toe the line of seeking due consent from from these participants before you use their image rights. Now, moving on to um, uh, issues of uh, dispute resolution, that goes without saying, in any in any business establishment, there's always going to be a certain form of dispute resolution to um, dispute uh, to arise uh, in the future. So, just like what is happening in traditional sports, where you have a streamlined mode of resolving those disputes, it will be best for the esports industry now that it's getting into that global. I, so that I could put things into perspective, so that there will be a uniform and um, fast mode of resolving these disputes. I know for a fact that the International Esports Federation has um, general statutes, and in those general statutes, it has a dispute resolution provision which stipulates that where there is any such dispute arising from the use of those, um, the interpretation of those statutes or competition by the IESF, then. Um, the, the matter could be brought to their committee or the board. And in any event, the Court of Arbitration for Sports has jurisdiction to hear those matters. Now, if that would have been a perfect uh, dispute resolution provision, you will know that all the members under the ISF would follow through. But because of the multiplicity of international sessions, you start to ask yourself, how would you go about enforcing those provisions uh, around the board? So that is an area that the esports uh, industry, uh, as well as uh, the Nigerian Esports Association, should look into. You know, I'll, I'll uh, ask you um, about the image rights now. You, you talked about um, seeking consent from the owners of these um, games before you can use their contents, or, or rather using the games to have a competition. Yes. What happens in a situation where, or how do you reach out to them? Because I've seen a couple of um, tournaments where I, I don't know if they got to reach out to the owners of these games, but I've seen a couple of tournaments held uh, on, on, I've seen them on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook. But I asked one of them, and he said he doesn't even know um, the um, bodies who own the PlayStation, one of the games they actually use in hosting this tournament. Is there a, a legal action? Is there a sanction that can be taken uh, on such people? Well, the, the thing is because the reason why I brought this up, I, I tend to think that because uh, esports is a developing area in Africa vis-a-vis uh, -vis Nigeria, we would not uh, easily uh, toe the line of looking at that angle of um, seeking uh, consent of image rights. But how, it's, how I would say it's supposed to work is there's meant to be a sort of, it could be expressed or implied, you could um, expressly impute it. For example, the esports uh, team owners, the esports managers, could sort of impute it in their compliance documents with with these players to consent to use their image rights for brand marketing. It could be uh, in, in their written uh, contract. So where that consent is, is duly sought and obtained, then I would think that there will be no no problem with the players. All right. Um, la last one from me now. Um now we're getting to see even the EPL get to feature up players in the FIFA 20. Do you think that with this whole pandemic, when it's over, do you think this would be a new form of competition for um, football players? When we have the regular league season, then we'll have the virtual league season. Will this happen? Um, I think this is, this is the dawn of the sports industry. I, I totally agree with your, your postulation because... Um, especially now with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a lot of people are, are bored, they're at home, uh, they, they want to be entertained. I could see a couple of um, Premier League players actually even engaging in uh, um, esports e sports to pass the time. They are even now, at, at that, that level, most of these football teams have virtual teams, just like you mentioned, they're also engaging in professional esports at the side. So I really, I, I really see a situation where there would soon be uh, a virtual league to that effect in addition to what's already happening. All right. So, yes. Thank you, Felix, for talking with us this morning.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oduka. All right, that was uh, Felix also giving us an update. And, of course, uh, looking at the commercial and the legal framework of the eSports and how um, this is beginning to grow in Nigeria. Now, there's also the thing about age limits. I've, I've gone to some game centers where um, they do not even control the age limits. Even if you're under 18, they still come in to play games. And when they're done, they go home. And it's all about the money, which I don't think it should be. Yes, um, and that, that's exactly what my colleague said when he... When you mention the fact that you need a central body, mm -hmm. just like you have, you have FIFA or FIBA for basketball, um, setting out the, some of the ground rules that will be applicable. What you have now is you have um, a lot of rules scattered all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's no coordination. So you need that central coordination where somebody will be able to actually coordinate um, most of these bodies and say, okay, set out a regulation just like you have with FIFA. Mm -hmm. with its own overarching rules that would apply uniformly to everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that is um, the, where we are getting to now. I'm sure by 2021 we should get there. All right, we have Ayo calling us from Lagos. Uh, how are you doing, Ayo? I'm fine. Good morning, Luca. Good morning. Let's have your contribution. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, earlier this morning, I was watching um, Super Sport, yeah, and I saw them playing PS4. I was wild, like, ah, when did this start? And now I just tuned in to Plus TV, and I started hearing eSports. And this is the first time I've been hearing this in my life. I never <laughs> knew there was something like eSports. Wow. So yeah. this is quite insightful. But my question is, is this. Um, the organizers of the eSports competitions, how do they recoup their their money. Mm. How do they generate revenue? Because you mentioned earlier that you were on Facebook or Instagram and you saw some people playing esports. So you were watching for free, right? <laughs> yes, of course. So there's nothing like um, ticket sales where fans go to the stadium to watch. So how do they generate income? I, I'm really curious. Well, from the, from the few ones I've experienced, that they, they get publicity matters a whole lot. When they have these competitions, they put it out there, they get the competitors to buy the forms, and there's a prize money as well. If, then if you want to come watch, there's a ticket fee that you get to pay. You come in there, and there are big screens that you can watch these games that these guys are playing. There are big screens that you can watch it from, and also um, support whichever player that you choose to support. So I, they, they generate a whole lot of money from this. Thank you very much. This is, this is really insightful. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be watching this right now. Thank you to Mr. Stephen Wabwezi too and Felix Ngosu. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you very much for your contribution, Ayo.